will be beginning uh, shortly. Uh, today's information session is uh, regarding an official community amendment application and zoning application for 770 Argyle Street. Uh, before we begin, I would like to add that we'll do our best to try to run this um, webinar as smoothly as we as we can. We had a last minute cancellation by our main facilitator, and this is our first time uh, running this kind of meeting. So I'd like to introduce uh, myself uh, first. So I'm uh, Audrey Tange. I'm the planning and licensing manager for the city of Penticton. Joining me as well tonight is uh, Ms. Nicole Capewell. She's the planner too with the city of Penticton and she's really the main contact for this particular uh, application. So the city's role here is to facilitate uh, the process for considering official community plan amendment applications. So we review the application for how it is aligning with our regulations and and policies. The city has had an engagement policy that specifically states that we need to reach out to uh, residents and include them in those conversations. Today's goal is really to uh, ensure that the residents are aware of the application as well as provide an opportunity to learn more and ask some questions. We'll be gathering feedback and share with the applicant and as well as council the, the feedback shared um, tonight. So how is this going to work? So as probably you've heard earlier, so this, this session is uh, recorded. Um, so first of all, um, this is so we can really capture the feedback we received in the discussion portion. So we uh, will start with the presentation uh, and then you'll have to, the chance to ask some questions and make some comments right after the presentation. Uh, we do have a, you know, a couple of interactive poll or Zoom poll or some question that you might be able to answer just to help us if you can. Um, so the first question that we have for the, the members that are here is, is which best describes your interest in um, attending today? So thank you so much for commenting and we're hoping, yeah, so it should appear on your screen and see if you can let us know which best describes your interest in the thing today. If you are around the property, if you own a business, if you're just a Penticton uh, resident. So if you could um, take the, the time to do it, that'd be great. Were you able to get the um, answers, Nicole? <laughs> yes, yeah, we just. Uh, just about got everybody has done it, so uh, I'm gonna I'll close the poll and then uh, I'm just gonna share results here. So hopefully everyone can see it. Okay, this is our first poll running. On, so <laughs> thank you. We appreciate your understanding. So lots of people are living um, near the property. Um, good to have people here that are near there. Okay, great. So thank you again for commenting. So now we'll just uh, move over to the presentation with uh, Ms. Cape, Ms. Cape Paul. And, and as I said, there is the uh, question and um, button down below. So as you're uh, going through uh, her presentation or like you can put some questions and the idea is that at the end of the presentation that we will be uh, able to answer, we'll go through the question as the best as we can and try to um, to assist that way. So move over to Ms. Capewell, please. Thank you. Thanks, Audrey. Uh, thanks everyone for attending tonight. It's nice to see um, so many of those that registered are, are attending. Um, so like Audrey mentioned, um, where there's gonna be three parts uh, to our workshop this evening. So first we'll provide a quick overview of the planning process, give you a, a planning 101 as to what we're really here for and what we're asking, um, and then how decisions on land use are made. Um, then we'll go into some key information about the proposal on Argyle Street, um, do a question and answer session, and give you some opportunities to ask some questions that you may have um, and as Audrey mentioned, the session's being recorded so that we can capture the discussion and any questions that come forward to help us um, make informed decisions and guide the applicant as they move forward. Uh, so the planning 101, so I'll just give a quick presentation of land use planning and some background about our official community plan. 
So the purpose of our official community plan, which we often refer to as an OCP document, you'll hear us say that quite frequently, uh, is it provides a framework of goals and policies to guide decisions on planning and land use within the city. The OCP was created with substantial public involvement and is meant to guide the evolution of the city up to 2045, by which time it is expected that the city will grow to about 42,000 people. Uh, the OCP establishes goals and policies uh, to enable sustainable growth within our community. And our official community plan is quite recent in the city. It was adopted by council in August of 2019. So while housing in Penticton is predominant, predominantly single detached houses, which is about 43% of our total uh, when the OCP was created, uh, this proportion has been decreasing. This trend is, is going to continue into the future due to the limited options for new single detached neighborhood development in the city, uh, the increased preference for more urban living closer to the downtown and other amenities, increased housing costs, and the needs of an aging population, uh, which we have in Penticton. The next largest segment um, of housing is low-rise apartments up to six stories, followed by other multi-housing types such as townhouses, high-rise apartments, as well as duplexes. Uh, so the city is expected to see an, an average annual population growth rate of 0.65% through to 2046. So that's the timeline that our OCP is envisioning to and trying to plan growth in the city. Where are we gonna put it and how are we gonna accommodate that growth uh, population? Our 2021 census was released recently and shows that Penticton has been growing quite quickly in the last five years with an average population growth rate of 1.86% per year between the 2016 and 2021 census data. In terms of housing uh, needs by housing type, the greatest future demand will be for duplexes as well as infill. Uh, so that's filling areas within the city. Um, this includes uh, developments such as row houses and townhouses. Uh, we're looking to provide about 1,500 units uh, by 2046. Um, however, there is going to be a need for all types of housing across the spectrum from single detached houses to apartments. The official community plan, uh, as I mentioned, outlines areas where the city expects that growth to occur. Uh, in our 2002, which is our previous OCP before this one, uh, we expected many areas up our hillsides were going to be developed, as you can see on the map on the left side. Uh, this shows the areas where we were expecting growth to occur. Um, in our 2019 OCP, which is on the right-hand side, uh, some of these growth areas have been scaled back, uh, and you can see more infill areas are proposed uh, to try to accommodate that growth. So that's where the infill development is becoming more popular uh, rather than pushing up into our hillsides, um, which includes some um, the upper Wiltsey lands. Um, there are some up on uh, Spiller Road as well. Uh, so those are the four yellow areas that are shown on the map. There's a few of those hillsides, but the rest is uh, proposed to be accommodated within our city limits, um, within the urban core area. Uh, so our OCP uh, outlines a plan to accommodate that growth in the next 25 years. As mentioned, most of it's going to be through intensification in our urban areas, maximizing our existing assets and infrastructure, uh, creating complete and accessible communities, intensifying uh, our underutilized and vacant land, and minimizing those negative impacts on natural areas. There is an emphasis on low-rise and mid-rise developments rather than high-rise developments. Um, a few key areas were identified for new hillside development to meet the demand for those uh, single detached homes. So this next section, so that's our planning 101. Um, so now I'm just gonna jump quick and do a brief overview of the proposal. So the property that we're referring to today is for 770 Argyle Street. I think that the proposal being considered would allow for multifamily residential development. Um, the, the applicants are proposing to construct uh, five separate duplex buildings, which would allow for 10 units on the subject property. Um, you can see here, there are some conceptual renderings that show what the buildings would look like. So they are uh, five three-story duplexes. In order to proceed, the applicant is required to change the official community plan future land use designation from a detached residential to ground-oriented residential. So this is uh, changing what we call the future vision for those properties. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in just a moment. Um, so the property is located on Argyle Street, which most people live near the property. So um, you're probably more familiar with it than we are if you live next door to it. Uh, so it's a large lot. There's two large lots there. We're talking about the northern one today. 
uh, located between Eckerd Avenue West and Scott Avenue. The property currently contains a single family home that was constructed uh, roughly in the 1930s. Uh, the property is currently zoned RD1, which is a duplex housing zone. It allows for one duplex or one single family to be constructed on the property. And the future land use designation, which is what we're looking at, uh, that's what the engagement is to consider, um, is what we envision on that property for the long term. So the current designation is what we call detached residential. And this slide here just kind of shows, this is, um, this is from our official community plan. So if you're interested and want to read uh, some more about the different designations, this is in that document that is publicly accessible. Uh, so the detached residential designation it supports lower density areas of single detached houses. Um, it also supports some duplexes in primarily residential neighborhoods. Uh, and it also supports single detached bare land strata. Building types that we often see in this designation include single family homes, uh, along with secondary suites or carriage homes, duplexes, and small scale commercial uh, and manufactured homes are also permitted there. So there's some images that kind of show uh, some development in Penticton that fits within that designation. And uh, the applicants are requesting to change that future land use designation to what we call ground-oriented residential to accommodate the additional density on the property. So the designation that they're looking to change to supports medium density residential areas, including duplexes with suites, um, cluster housing, which is what the proposed development is considered, uh, as well as row and townhouse development. So it's a bit more density uh, than exists there today, um, and it can be seen in different forms as shown through uh, the images on the slides. Uh, so this is the site plan for the proposed development. I did try to make it a little bit easier to read from our um, in-person session that we held a few weekends ago. Um, so you can see uh, north is oriented um, to the top of the map. So Argyle Street is on the left. And then I've drawn some red boxes around the five buildings. Um, so the site plan, like I mentioned, is oriented with north to the top. The duplexes are located three meters from the southern property line, and the drive aisle and primary vehicle access is on the northern portion of the property, and they access off of Argyle Street. They have provided uh, one parking space per unit, uh, as well as eight visitor parking spaces, which is more than was required by our zoning bylaw, which is great. Um, so this slide I just want to quickly show is the process and kind of the next steps that occur for the engagement. Um, it shows where, kind of where we're at as well. Um, so the engagement period is what we're currently going through where we collect the feedback from the public. Um, as Audrey mentioned, once the engagement period ends, uh, we review all the results, they're summarized and shared back with council. So um, we've received a lot of feedback forms already. And once the engagement session closes, those results and on all the comments that you provide are shared directly with council. Um, we do redact them so personal information is removed, but they do see all of the all of the comments, all the words that you're putting forward to them. Um, so we share that information back with council, uh, the public. It's available on Shape Your City, and we also share it back with the applicant. Um, the applicant can make adjustments um, or changes to the plan based on the feedback that they receive from the public. Um, once they make those changes, or if they choose to not make any changes, we would eventually proceed with the proposal to, uh, to council. So we would bring back the formal official community plan and zoning amendment bylaws to council, and they would choose to hold a public hearing. This is the legislative requirement for both the zoning and OCP bylaws. Um, this is important for you to note because this is the next formal opportunity for the public to speak to council directly about their comments or concerns. Um, and then after that, council gives consideration as to whether they want to uh, move forward with the proposal. So um, I do note that when council has directed us to begin engagement, it doesn't signify that council has endorsed, supported, or approved this proposal. They just want to hear from the community about what you think about this property and whether we want to see more density there in the future. Um, considering approval of the development, like I mentioned, wouldn't occur until after the public hearing, where they do hear the formal um, feedback from the public at a, at a formal public hearing. So it's important to note that there is going to be another opportunity for you to speak to council. And there's also an opportunity that the applicant could make changes to the plan. So it's important um, to continue to stay um, engaged in the development and see if the applicant does take some of the considerations to the plan and decide to make any adjustments. 
Um, so if you received a public notice in the mail for this engagement period, you would also be receiving a notice in the mail when this proceeds to public hearing. And we encourage you to stay tuned. Um, you can watch our Shape Your City website as well as the city's public notice page um, to stay tuned for the public hearing. If you have any concerns about the proposal at that time, we encourage you to come and bring them forward to council. That's this nice uh, big process to go through. So that leads us to the next um, slide here. Yeah, we have another uh, Zoom poll here. So uh, based on the information that Ms. Capewell presented, uh, do you do you have concern about what is being considered uh, for this site? This site? In the chat function, you can also uh, add if there's specific feature that you have uh, that you like or you don't like. Um, so we're happy to again hear some of your concern or or things that you might you might uh, like here. Just watching to see how many people we've got. Um, well, we've got some coming out. So I'm going to give it uh, another second here and then I'll close it and share the results with everyone. Okay. So, so we got quite a few people are participating, which is great. And so it looks like we've got a number that, yeah, has have some concern. And then we also have about 40% here that uh, seem to say that, yeah, there's no concern. I'm looking at the chat here, but Lori here uh, comments on too many buildings on one site, uh, plus some more concerns. So if you want to add some more uh, feature in there, Lori, happy to, again, uh, take notes on, on those. Um, so the idea is now uh, that we'll move, be moving into the discussion section. Uh, so this is the time to, on that Q&A uh, at the bottom here, uh, it's the time for, for you all to uh, answer some of your, uh, your questions. So please enter your question. Uh, again, we, I just want to like to add that we will try to do our best to answer the question the best as, as we can. Uh, we may need to skip some if we have already have um, answered, but uh, see here, I just wanted to code maybe the loop on the, some of the, I see there's a um, there's a few few things. Lori is mentioning that her list is uh, uh, too long, too close to the property boundaries. So probably just maybe uh, again, in terms of setback from Chandra here. Um, Terry here, uh, again, proposed design lack of creativity, green spaces. Um, lack of visual co cohesiveness to the rest of the neighborhood. Uh, Tanya here, concern about density, appearance, uh, seems to be something that comes comes back uh, from the open house as well. Um, maintaining the maintenance of the heritage nature of the neighborhood. And we've got again, uh, recurring density too high, a style of the development that does not fit into that uh, that neighborhood. Parking, uh, which we hear often uh, with our application, buildings uh, too high. Uh, again, not complementing the historical architecture of the neighborhood. Um, yeah, so maybe what we'll do is we kind of, I'm going to just switch to the question here and then see. I think, uh, I know I saw when uh, Lori added her comments about. Uh, there's something about parking spot or there's an extra parking spot. So if you'd like to answer, uh, Nicole, please. Yeah, I'm just gonna uh, jump back to the site plan here. So um, thanks for the questions, Lori. So the requirements for parking in our zoning bylaw for this type of development is 1.25 parking spaces per dwelling unit. Um, so you can see that each, like I mentioned, each unit has their own parking space um, on the main floor within a, a garage that each unit will have. So that's the one parking space. And then there are eight visitor parking spaces that are provided along the northern side of the property line. Um, so they're only required to provide, I believe it's two additional parking spaces for the visitors. Yeah and they've provided eight. So they've actually provided six additional parking spaces 
um, compared to what our zoning bylaw does require them to have. Um, I know we did hear at the last um, at the last open house that we held at the museum and library and we hear with every development is that it's not enough parking um, so it is we get stuck between I want to say rock and a hard place and that that's what our zoning bylaw requires um, our OCP and all of the sustainable um, planning is trying to encourage us to do infill development so people are closer to those amenities they're closer to shopping their services and there's the ability for people to um, use alternative modes of transportation um, so if we if we require a lot of parking um, you know we, we start to lose some unit counts but parking is is always a concern for every development that we deal with um, and it's uh, it it can be a very valid concern especially when um, which is what was also mentioned at the open house it starts to spill over onto the street and that's definitely a concern for um, neighbors so we do encourage you if if parking is a concern which I think it is for a lot of people to still put that um, encourage, encourage you to put it in your feedback forms when you fill those out because um, the feedback forms are the the items that we use to tally a lot of the statistics and share those back with council um, so those are the extra parking spaces that are there okay, um, thanks. thanks Nicole I think, I think Lori next, also asked yeah about, about Arga the yeah the access yeah so um, I was going to just pull up on the map because I think that this um, that this might show it a little bit better. And we did have some questions at the um, open house when we were at the library, and I didn't have um, I didn't have the computer open to be able to show it this way. So um, if you just bear with me a moment, I'm just going to open the map and show you. So if you want to, I appreciate or patience for me. Okay, so the subject property like I say is 770 Argyle Street. So they are proposing their access, um, I'm hoping you can see my mouse here, is to come off of this northern section of the property here. Um, so unfortunately these properties do not have um, a road or a laneway at the rear of the property. Um, this is privately owned land at the back here. So it's part of a legal parcel that's associated with some of these other multifamily apartment buildings at the back. So their vehicle access is going to come in and out of that Argyle Street here. Um, so if I quickly jump back to my, um, my PowerPoint here, and then I'll show you again the site plan. So you can see that this comes, the site plan here comes in and they have provided uh, these no parking turnaround areas for vehicles to turn around and go back out. Um, this is reviewed by our development engineering department to make sure that there is uh, appropriate turnaround space for them to be able to safely um, do that with the building location as well as the other parking locations that are there. So um, I'm hoping that answers uh, the question, but please let me know if, um, if it hasn't. Okay, the next, I think, I um, mean, Lori said, yeah, so it, it is in Scott. So just to answer your, your question, um, Lori. So I think the next one, um, uh, just looking through here for Lori, uh, it's a very large development on land that cannot bear the proposed site, five duplex building. Each unit will have three bedrooms, two and a half bathroom, the garage. The units are, are massive. Um, I think, I think it's almost more common than a question, but you know, Laurie's feeling that two or three buildings with a community garden space and common area and a play space will be a far better plan for for the community. So thanks, thanks very much, Laurie, for that uh, comment. Um, next, uh, Laurie again. So developer says that it's been designed to complement the historical architecture of the neighborhood. I do, I do not see any way uh, the design fits into the architecture or flavor of the area. This very tall box-like structure have no redeeming feature that fit them into the historic neighborhood. And again, like it's a common, and we've heard that quite a bit, uh, same as the, um, uh, the open house, but uh, Nicole, if you wanna jump in. Yeah, um, like Audrey mentioned, this was something that came forward quite a bit for us at the open house, and I have seen it. I'm just watching the chat, um, and there is a few um, there's a few people that have mentioned it. So um, I'm I think that that's going to show through in the statistics when we when we run out um, 
and collect all the feedback forms at the end. So um, like we mentioned, make sure you're putting it in there. And I have a feeling that this comment will probably, it will circulate back to the applicant and the designer um, to consider whether they would like to make any um, architectural changes or amendments to try to better reflect um, those concerns. Um, so they, they have applied for a development permit uh, with the application, which does look at the form and character. So this is something that we are looking at at this time. So those comments are very valid at this point. Um, and that would be stuff, something that we would review with them. So we're hoping this, this is the time for you to provide those comments because they haven't approved anything yet. And this is where the applicants and council are listening to what you're saying. So um, we appreciate you bringing forward those comments. Um, and we'll definitely make sure that that's reiterated back to the designer and the applicant to consider uh, when they move forward with this to council. Thank you, Nicole. And I think the next question is from, is from Marlene. It does look like anyone can park behind garage. Uh, is that correct? Um, yes. So they are single car garages. Um, if you just give me a minute here, I do have the... Um, I have the ground floor site plan that I can share, and I'm thinking that that's what Arlene is um, wondering about, if you can. Uh, drive through the garage is maybe what I'm thinking, um, or on the front side of the garage on the site plan. So um, so this they were only single car garages, um, which is great for them to be able to uh, you know, provide lots of people like parking their car in the garage, they won't be able to park in front of their garages because they would be blocking the drive aisle and the garage doesn't go through to the back of the property. So um, they are just single car garages. Um, I hope that answered the question, but let us know if it did not, please. The next question is uh, from Laurie. I think Laurie is wondering whether or not there is a climate solution that, that's incorporating in this construction, whether or not there is uh, EV charging, secure bike, solar panel, uh, step five passive home, zero emission. Um, if you're aware of anything that the, uh, the developer is proposing, Nicole. Um, so I'm just trying to think, I don't know if they are proposing to have uh, electric vehicle charging. It is becoming um, a standard, uh, like the bare minimum is what we're finding that they are, lots of them are including it. There's lots of grants that are available for it. Um, we don't require this at our development permit and zoning and OCP stage. Um, I'm not 100% sure if the building department is requiring those but we can certainly look into those items for you um the bike parking i'm going to just share the site plan again so they have provided uh with the garages they are large enough to accommodate the vehicle as well as um the units are are adequate in size to be able to accommodate um, bike parking. They are also required to have other bike parking spaces provided. So you can see in between some of these buildings, um, we have two different types of bike parking. Class one is the secure bike parking for those that either live at the, um, live in there, or if they have guests that are coming to stay with them, that they can park their, their bicycles inside and they can't be accessed or seen from outside. And then we have class two bicycle parking, which is provided here as well. Um, they're required to provide these two, two spaces here. Um, they're actually only required to provide one parking or one class two bicycle space, but this is where you would park if you're just coming to visit someone that lives there and you're parking your bike outside on uh, one of the bicycle racks. So they are secure, but they're not closed in um, and out of sight for someone if they were going by. So those are the two kinds. Um, the solar panels, um, we don't have that requirement. Um, but we can certainly pass the information along. And the step code is done uh, with our building department. They are slowly increasing the, the codes that are, uh, the steps that are required. Um, and the other items that you've mentioned there, we can certainly check into. Um, we just don't have those requirements in place yet uh, for the new builds, but I think the, the building codes in our building department with our bylaws are starting to increase um, the sustainability minimums for new builds, which is um, which is great and it's slowly getting there. But I did note your second comment there, Lori, that this needs to be required by our city and it's something um, we are actively looking at. Um, incorporating that into our zoning bylaw, I believe is 
the work is underway. So we appreciate your comments and pushing us to get on it faster. Yeah, it's definitely something that, uh, especially the EV charging, there's some um, definitely um, policy that supports that in the OCP. And uh, the goal in the next few months, uh, Lori, is that we're going to manual zoning bara to make it a requirement for uh, every multifamily um, building. So it's something we're working on. So uh, definitely good, uh, good comments there, Lori. So I think there's another comment about uh, why would they cut down trees, uh, which provide shade and, and plant tiny trees uh, that don't, Nicole? Um, yeah, this is always a challenging um, question. So um, I'm, I believe that there is some trees on the property right right now. Um, so we don't have any tree protection bylaws for private property in the city. So a, a property owner, unless you're in an environmental uh, protection area or a riparian area along a waterway, um, you are able to remove and cut down trees on your property. Um, this is something I believe that's been it's been brought forward to council before, and we haven't um, we haven't created any bylaws that change that to require permits. Um, there is there is provisions in our official community plan that uh, developers can consider this when they're looking to make developments. Um, sometimes it's very challenging to be able to do that depending on their location. Um, the access in and out for this property is very difficult um, to navigate around mature trees, especially with coming in and out one way. Um, so there's always challenges um, and we don't have a requirement at this point in time for them to retain those trees. Um, and we, the last thing I'll add is we do have minimum size um, and height requirements for new trees when they're planted in. Um, I wouldn't say that they're large by any means, but we do have, um, they're required to be uh, a certain diameter um, around um, their stem and they're required to be 1.5 meters in height. So they're not, they're not tiny, tiny, but we do, they are quite small because um, they will, uh, that's when they're uh, come from the uh, nursery and the um, garden centers to be able to put them in so that they can uh, get rooted and survive. So I'm just going to move over to the chat because I think I just, uh, yeah, there are some questions in the chat as well. There's a question from Mark here. If uh, currently there is no crosswalk uh, across Argyle at Eckert, and as angle corner, it is dangerous to cross already. Is there any consideration for this corner for pedestrian traffic with the proposed uh, extra vehicle traffic? Uh, sorry, that came from Mark. That's Mark. a great question. Um, so the, the applications are reviewed by our development engineering department. Um, this, I'm not sure, I'd have to confirm with them to make sure whether this was reviewed or not, but we can certainly bring that item forward to them to review whether um, additional pedestrian crossings are gonna be a concern in that area and whether it, there is a warrant um, for adding a crossing there and if it's safe to do so at that location, because I, I believe that might be near where the road does its turn, but um, I'll leave it to the engineers because we're we're planners, um, so I don't want to try to guess on the sidewalks, but um, we appreciate the comments and definitely will bring it forward um, uh, to our engineering department. Thanks, Nicole. And there's another question I think you probably have um, about uh, city waste and recycling program and whether or not they'll need to make their own arrangements for pickup or is it um, city collecting? Um, yeah, so they are required uh, to sort their garbage pickup for the multifamily. So um, they usually work, we have a sustainability coordinator um, that works at the city and he helps when we receive these applications, uh, his name is David and he works with the developers to come up with a location that is accessible for uh, those, those units to be collected. Um, and then also helps them to find solutions that make sense. And then for us in planning, we make sure that uh, important things for us is that they're screened accordingly um, and that they're located um, not in, you know, right uh, unscreened by uh, the public way. So these ones, they are screened and they will be covered. Um, they're always, sometimes they are tricky 
to locate uh, so that a truck can still go in and get them without having to back all the way back out onto the street. Um, but David does look to make sure that they are providing both recycling and garbage that is large enough uh, to serve the units that are being provided. So that is something that's looked at and it's looked at by um, uh, David's a sustainability coordinator. So he also is making sure, like I say, the recycling, that there's enough of that that's provided there. Okay, thank you, Nicole. Uh, I think we've kind of answered the, the question about climate change. So we can move over. I think Char is asking if we have any stats on how many one car family live in duplexes. I'm not sure we have that kind of stats. I don't think so. No. Um, I do want to note that uh, Cynthia has her hand up. I don't know if you can see that or not, but I'm going to, I'm thinking, Cynthia, do you, ha would you like to ask a question? Um, I can let you turn on your microphone if you would like to ask a question for us. Oh, your hand is down now. <laughs> um, I think she was the one that had the question questions. about recycling, but yeah, oh, she's got more, okay. Let me just get the PowerPoint. Just bear with me for one second. And I think you're asking about whether there's gonna be more trees planted. I'm just gonna pull up the landscaping plan here for you. Bear with me. Bunch of windows. Really appreciate your patience because we usually have uh, another staff to help us with this. And Joanne is, um, wonderful guru to help us with this. So here we go. Okay, so here's the site or the landscape plan. Um, so you can see uh, they have provided uh, trees that are along, there are some along the street. So along Argyle here in front of the first building, they've also provided several trees that are along the south property line and then a few along the um, eastern property line, which is the rear of the property. And then there are also several scattered along the northern property line. Um, we also require uh, shrubs throughout the property um, along those same property lines as well. All of the landscaping um, is required to be irrigated by underground um, irrigation lines. And they often are also located or um, contain the moisture sensors so that they are as water efficient as possible. Our parks department also reviews the landscape plans to make sure that they're providing plants that are suitable for where they're being planted um, for our climate, as well as the location of where the property is. Great, uh, thanks, Nicole. There's a comment here from Marlene about the current unit selling price, um, which I'm, I don't think we can we can answer, but we can. Yeah, I think the, the comment is that the units are probably going to sell for around 650 to 850 uh, with the current uh, interest rate increases family with net income of 100,000 can afford. And uh, so it's definitely something that comes up again uh, very often. Uh, but yeah, at this point, we do not have the, the selling unit price that they are considering. Um, we've got the next uh, question from Chandra. Can we not implement a similar uh, balas in Vancouver? And I'm assuming you're talking about, uh, you know, tree protection to make a uh, developer keep uh, existing tree. And again, very, very fair comment uh, about what we do not have, as Nicole mentioned, um, the, the bylaw, but uh, if you wanted to add anything, Nicole. Um, no, I think, I mean, like I said before, it's been posed to council, I think before, and we have heard it. Uh, in different areas across uh, the community and in the Cherryland neighborhood before for other uh, smaller developments that have happened. Um, you know, trees are very important and they do form part of the neighborhood character. Um, we are unfortunately limited in some instances where um, we get into a fun challenge of um, give and take with property owners and regulating too much. Um, and then people, you know, you can get frustrated that you can't cut down a tree without getting a permit or we won't issue a permit. Um, it, it's, it's challenging, um, but it's certainly something that there is an authority that council could do. We just don't have those bylaws in place yet. Some places do, I believe, like Vancouver, I think Victoria also has some. So they are around. We just don't have them in place um, in Penticton. 
Okay, thanks, Nicole. Uh, I think there's another comments about uh, any thoughts as to why the developer choose to put the road on the north side of the property. Um, I'm not sure if you can answer that um, question, Nicole. <laughs> I want, I kind of want to guess at it, but I don't know that that's a good thing to do. So um, I know sometimes they want to try to mitigate the impacts on the other properties. So if they locate the buildings on the north side, then they're going to be directly overlooking into the single family um, or the, the property that's to the north. Um, whereas this way they are next to the other property 784 that has a similar development uh, that's going to be proposed. So the buildings are next to each other then. So the heights aren't directly over the single families on either side or the, um, the properties on either side. Um, and then the, the driveway somewhat acts as a buffer space to, to kind of limit that overlook. But that would be um, my guess to it. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the reason why the developer and the designer have actually done it that way, but sometimes that is a strategy that they will consider when they're doing such things. Great, thanks, Nicole. Uh, the comments about uh, comment uh, from Lori here that we had a heat dome last year, 44 degrees, people died. Uh, we need more canopy for cooling. The trees for this property will not have space to get tall enough for shade because the buildings are taking the greater part of the site. Uh, will there be water permeable asphalt? And I'm sure, I'm not sure if you have that information, Nicole, in the drawings, what they're proposing. Um, I, I don't believe that they're proposing to, to have the permeable um, pavement on this property. So uh, the zone that they're going to, we don't regulate hard surfacing. Um, so it's, it's definitely a concern. Um, we have had some developments uh, look at adding permeable surfacing for some other um, developments, which I think, uh, Laura, you've provided that comment for those ones as well, which, um, which is great. Um, we just don't have that requirement for this. And um, I don't believe that they're planning to use permeable um, pavement or asphalt or concrete, concrete for this instance. We're happy to, to get those feedback again, uh, Lori, to, that we can share with the, with the developer. I think that's, uh, that's very, it's crucial here. So thanks for, um, for, the, for those comments. So there's uh, another question, uh, and I think I see it in the chat and then as well as Chandra here, and there's kind of Mark as well. So kind of curious about uh, what we know about what is planned for 784 uh, Argyle. And I believe, Nicole, you have a slide. On that. Yeah. Um, so I do have I do have the site plan here for Argyle. Or whoops, I'm looking at the wrong screen. Um, so 784 Ar Argyle is the property to the south. Um, so they are proposing um, an 11 unit uh, development. So similar in unit count. Um, they are proposing it kind of a different style of building. We still consider this cluster housing. So you can see there's three buildings, two of the buildings, building A and building B have four units in them. So they're four plexes. And the last building, building C is a three plex building. Uh, so 11 units in total. You'll notice each, um, each unit has two parking spaces. So they each have their garage and a parking space. Uh, it's a different, quite a different design. So there is room on this uh, plan for a vehicle to park in front of their garage and not block that drive aisle um, that vehicles access through, which is definitely over what we require. And then they have also provided at the very end here, they have two guest parking spaces um, at the end there, as well as their garbage and recycling. Uh, the buildings are similar in height, I believe, to the neighboring property at three stories with the garage on the main level and then two above. Um, so they have a similar looking landscape plan. And then this is uh, the rendering that we have for that development on the neighboring property there. Um, I think there's yeah. a few questions about this one, uh, whether or not it's the same same developer, which I believe is two different, um, two different property owners, Nicole. Yeah, so they are different owners, different designers, uh, different developers. Um, they are, it's not the same on, on both of them. 
So I think there's another comments here. Yeah, did I hear correctly? Property is planned to build the same type of building. So, which is yes, uh, this is something that's that uh, an OCP and a zoning bylaw was previously approved uh, a few years uh, back. Um, so similar, and but as Nicole mentioned, not the same same uh, design. Um, just see here. Um, got a comment from Lori. Uh, and um, I think the next one would be uh, from Chandra. These buildings are three story high to accommodate a garage. I know there's concern about the building's height. Is it possible to build an underground uh, garage, Nicole? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a great question, Chandra. Um, this kind of, I wanna say ties into, there's a lot of different things that play in with underground parking. Um, in Penticton, we are located between uh, two lakes. We have um, the channel and the oxbows used to go all meandering through where Penticton now is. So there's always concerns with groundwater in Penticton. Um, underground parking and even going down a little bit is always challenging. Um, that being said, um, our engineers like to say anything's possible if you have enough money to put at it. And this kind of ties back to the question uh, and concern that came up about the affordability of the unit. So when you start doing underground parking, your affordability of your unit um, just kind of goes out the window because underground parking becomes very expensive very quickly. Um, so, it, and there has to be room to drive down under the site, which these properties is, is very hard because they're large, but they're not, um, they're not huge to be able to build ramps going down or anything. So that's, that's often the challenge that comes uh, with those usually we see it in larger buildings where the developers can make up the cost uh, by having a significant number of units. So the more units that they can have sometimes tries to bring down the cost of each unit when they're selling those. But the underground parking can be extremely expensive for all of the work they need to do to investigate if it's even possible. And then if they do run into groundwater issues after it's built, they have to deal with um, with that and pumping later, which again adds those costs to all the costs get put onto the homeowner at the end, which doesn't help with the affordability problem of it. So um, anything's possible. It's just the affordability aspect doesn't stay there when we do underground parking for this type of a development. Thank you, Nicole. I think uh, there is a comment uh, there from Timothy uh, saying that it'd be, be good to see a collaboration and more cohesive design plan between the two, which I think, again, it's a, we've heard a lot of comments about the design and, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's a good point that you're, you're raising here. Next one, um, I think there's something else in the chat here from, uh, from Mark, kind of uh, again, tied into the, the design, uh, just comments, no consideration for exterior design, past, present or future. Is this not something that should be considered well beforehand? Yeah, so again, this comes back to the design of the buildings. Um, there, it's always challenging for us to be uh, too prescriptive with the design. Um, so it's it's great that the public um, and the neighbors are bringing this up, that this is something that matters in this neighborhood to them. And we do, like I mentioned before, we do plan to bring this back to the designer and, and ask them if they would like to consider adding some different design changes to the building to fit better within the area and perhaps um, acknowledge some of the historic components to other buildings in that area and hopefully um, in doing so that they might be able to alleviate that concern that's come forward from the neighbors. Um, there's definitely ways that they can, you know, try to um, complement that while still providing a new building that tries to address all these sustainability issues that Lori has mentioned for us. So there's ways to do it. We just have to um, get your comments and bug us, keep bugging us to get them to do it. So it, it all does go back to them. Yeah, and I think this, yeah, Lori added again, the concern about more uh, thoughtful design, which could really lead us into the future and make us uh, a leader in walkable, friendly style construction. I think again, it's the sort of that hot asphalt that she's kind of referenced um, before. So thanks for that uh, comment, Lori. I think Chandra had an additional question, Nicole, on um, the underground uh, parking. 
She's curious why there are three stories proposed when older places have two stories and, and probably she's referencing the maybe like just the at grade parking or just um, I'm assuming. Yeah, it's um, why they have three stories when older have uh, two stories and parking. Um, it's it's challenging. I mean, they are within um, they're within. I want to say they're within the zoning that they're requesting to go to, but that is why we're here because they want to hear from the neighbors as to whether that density is suitable for this area. So, a single family home, um, I guess, is what we can look at um, under the zone that's there right now. A duplex or single family can go up to ten and a half meters in height, uh, which is three stories. Um, often we see a garage on the main floor. Um, a single family doesn't have to go through this development process like uh, this applicant does. So um, it's always challenging for them to be able to make it work and make their numbers work. Sometimes um, that's not the only factor that should be considered, but for the developer, um, that is a big factor for them. The less floor area that they have available for their um, for the tenants or for the purchasers that end up being in there, then um, it, it, it kind of drives up all the costs. Um, so it's, it's always challenging. The height is very challenging, but there's, I mean, there's creative design ways um, depending on whether they decide to change the design of the buildings that they can accommodate perhaps some, um, some dormers by uh, reducing it a little bit in height and still getting the stories in the floor area that they need to make it work economically for them. So um, yeah, hope, um, yeah, we'll see what they're able to come up with at the end of the day. I'm not an architect or a designer, so um, they can get creative with it if, if they uh, want to. So hopefully we'll see them come back with some creative solutions for it. Yeah, and I think Chandra added, yeah, uh, her comment about, and by older places, I mean other properties with similar design that have been built previously. And I think, again, it comes back to sort of the surface parking and garages. Garages are something that a lot of people are looking for as well. Uh, not everybody, you know, appreciate the, the surface parking. We have a little bit of both. Usually garages are a bit higher end, um, but again, I think uh, happy to hear that comments and we can share with, uh, with the developer. Um, next question I believe is, uh, who is the developer? Uh, for both sides and, and where are they from? Uh, they, they are private developers, so they're not, um, I'm just trying to think, uh, this one for 770, I guess I am still, I'm still scaring uh, other, the 784 one. So I'm just gonna jump back to this one that we're talking about. Um, so they are different developers. So this is a private uh, individual that's doing this particular proposal. It's not a company um, that's doing this one. And the other one is the same. It, it's an individual that's doing it. They have hired designers that we are familiar with working um, in the area, but they're not, um, they're not companies. Um, so we are always limited with the private owner information that we're able to share for, for those. Um, so that's, it, it's a tough answer for us to give each I time. know. Okay, thanks, Nicole. Uh, the next from Timothy, could I get the date of the 784 Argyle first reading to council? I was just putting it up here. Uh, this was back a few years uh, back. So in 2000, and, so April 18, uh, 2016, uh, that's when uh, we brought forward, or the planning department brought forward an OCP amendment and the zoning am amendment for that. Uh, property. So it, uh, recently we did the development permit, uh, but you know, when council actually approved the zoning and the OCP was back in 2016. Um, so I hope that that answer your, uh, your question and not to the next, um, just uh, looking here. If we have anything else that I'm missing. Here, do you see anything else, Nicole, that we have not? There's some comments about the developer want to make more money. Yes, that's... Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Timothy's asking about the 784 Argyle, so the OCP. So um, for that, for the 784, they had amended the OCP. It was done, like Audrey said, uh, 2016, it went to council. So um, it was done under our 2002 official community plan. Um, so they had proposed to amend the OCP that was done at the time. Um, and they went from a low density to a medium density, as well as the rezoning to the RM2. Um, the zoning of RM2 exists on the property today. Through the development of the 2019 OCP, um, this neighborhood was changed to the, well, not changed, it was just, it was um, maintained that low density. We didn't keep the definition of a low density residential designation. We switched it to a, a detached residential, which is what these properties are now. Um, but they, when that happened, they did retain the zoning that was in place. So 784 was entitled to that um, that zoning that exists on the property, which um, they did build to um, when they came in for their uh, permits for that development recently. I hope that makes sense. It's a lot of planning jargon. <laughs> that we go through. So if any of that doesn't make sense, you can always follow up with us afterwards as well. And we can um, provide some of the uh, information for you if needed. And that's the same with any of the items that we're going through today. We're here, um, we're here to answer any questions that you have in order to make the informed decisions uh, when you fill out the feedback form and provide your comments back to council. Just the comments back. Thank you. I just wanted to look up the full plan. Um, um, yeah, Tim, um, I'm just thinking, uh, Timothy, sorry, I don't know if I have a slide at the end of the presentation with my email on it, but I will um, make a slide right now that has it. And you can send me an email um, and I'm happy to send you a copy of the plan um, for 784 so that you can look at that uh, information. Just wondering if there's any other question. I see a comment from uh, Loi here that, um, you know, the, coming back about the buildings are too close to each other as well. I think it's coming back to her, her comments about adding more open spaces and um, more amenity as well. Uh, I'm not sure if there's anyone else that uh, wanted to add any other questions to, um, either to the question and a or in the chat here so I can see if we've tried to cover as many questions as uh, as uh, as we can uh, let's see if we're missing anything here there's a comment from Chandra again on the design that uh, these property um, does not create um, so that sense of uh, of community I think it's Again, it's just coming back to like, you know, the, the heritage part, what, what's in the area. I think we keep hearing the same uh, the same information. Um, anybody else uh, have any other question that we hoping that we can assist to, to uh, answer um, before we, it's been an hour, so, so far, uh, so good. Uh, are there any points the planners have for the developer that we have not uh, discussed. Anything, Nicole, that you can think of uh, that we haven't talked about today? I don't think so. I mean, uh, before we bring the application to the public, we do a, a heavy technical review of it before we even get to this point. Um, so we have provided a lot of comments back to the applicant. Um, they have made a number of revisions to the plans um, before we even brought this to council to bring to the public. Um, but there's still certainly uh, opportunities for them to make changes, like I've said a few times. Um, but we do go through a lot of our comments ahead of time, so we wouldn't, we don't bring uh, stuff to you if we have concerns with, like, like I mentioned, the garbage or the vehicle access. Those things have to work before we get to this point. So. Um, you, everyone has pointed out some really good, um, really good comments and questions, the underground parking, the sustainability, um, electric vehicle charging stations, everything is important and everything like Lori's seeing with the uh, EV stations probably going to become a requirement here soon. It all makes a difference 
um, when the public tells us what they want and council listens and we're listening and we're making changes to always improve our bylaws to represent sustainability and uh, making the city and community better place. So all good information. Yeah. There's one more comment. Yeah, I think Chandra just wanted to add that, uh, yeah, talk about the heritage, but also how will the neighbors interact? No central place to, to, to gather. And I think that was her point about that sense of uh, community. Um, just going to check the question and answer and see that that'll be kind of the last. Um, Laurie, uh, just comment about it's too dense, too close together, too warehouse-like. This design is boxy, not neighborhood friendly. Uh, and then there's a question about the Windsor Avenue Cherryland boundaries have not been set. Can the development be put on hold till then? Um, that's a question. I mean, um, so council have given some directions to. Um, um, to the city to implement or to looking at some changes in the zoning bar in regards to the Cherry Lane uh, neighborhood. Uh, by, by zoning bar, they are looking at, you know, maybe uh, looking at uh, setting a height limit uh, in, uh, in terms of the, um, the setback. Uh, so that's a process that will most likely uh, come back to council in, in June. I think the question is whether we can put the, the development to be put on hold. Again, uh, we're kind of working concurrently and this is just the first step. The engagement is the first step. Uh, there's many other opportunities for us to um, come back to council. There'll be some time before we come back for, if we come back for a first reading. So this might be in place. And again, that might have a, an impact, but again, we're kind of working in the same same uh, same uh, direction, but hoping um, so that, uh, we take both in consideration. So hoping that answer your question. Um, anything else? Um, I think there's a question about visitor parking. I think you've kind of addressed it, Nicole, but if you want to bring it back there, uh, I think you've answered eight visitor parking spaces, 18 spaces in total. Uh, and then the last one. I think uh, these two properties are very close to the entrance to the community at Argyle and Eckerd. They do not convey the feeling of the community in such an obvious location. And thank you for that comment, Chandra. Um, I think that's it. If there's nothing else, I'm really excited. Thank you so much for listening to this presentation. And I know it was a little bit kind of rocky for me and Nicole as the first time we're kind of running this, but this has been, this is, this is good for us. And, and also like, thank you for answering the interactive poll. And again, this is, this is being um, uh, recorded. So again, we will share with our engagement team uh, that couldn't uh, attend today. So we hope that this really helped you understand this proposal uh, in, uh, in more detail. And if you haven't done so already, like please complete a feedback form uh, before our engagement. The engagement is still running. I, I believe it closes on uh, May 15th, May, May 15th, yes. Um, so we did um, give enough time for you to take this information after this uh, online session and um, uh, do any um, thinking that you needed to ask us more questions after this meeting. Uh, and. Um, then go fill out a feedback form. So your informed decision making and feedback for council and us. And I think, um, if you'd uh, like any of any of the plans, um, you're welcome to, you can pop by city hall or send me an email um, and I can share digital copies of the plans. They are also available on the Shape Your City website when you go to the 770 Argyle um, tab on Shape Your City. On the right hand side of the page, there's a bunch of links there that you can go in and download and be able to view them. If you have any problems though, please um, let us know and we can um, we can get copies, paper, digital for you. Um, my contact, that reminds me, my contact information is on Shape Your City as well. I believe at the top or bottom of the 770 Argyle page. And there's just one more question and that I'm not sure, Nicole, if you've, from your experience is, it is recorded, but can they go back and watch? I'm assuming that we'll be putting it back, probably the recording on Shape Your City, but I'm not sure what you've done in the past, if you're aware, if, uh, um, that's a good question, Arlene. Um, it's 
It is recorded. Um, I don't know if we post it publicly or if it's for internally for us to watch, but um, we can confirm that uh, with Joanne Kleb, our um, engagement specialist. And if it is available, it would be on Shape Your City shortly after this um, this evening. So once she has a chance to put it together and post it, it would be. Um, I, I can't recall if we've done it for other instances, but we can definitely check with her if you'd like to rewatch it again. Okay, well, thank you again. Thank you for taking the time. And you know, this is uh, this is very informative for us. This is great. Lots of good comments. You know, we really appreciate your thoughts and then and, and and then the questions and then all the information that was was shared. And again, please uh, do not hesitate to to contact us for more questions. I'm sure they they will be. And again, thank you so much and have a nice uh, rest of the evening. Thank you, everyone.